We're starting with a photo from the Yale archives of a construction site on York Street in 1926. You can see down there, somebody wrote York Street Dormitory. Um, it's more recent than most of the work in the Builder Book, but you can see at that time the scaffolding is still wood, still kind of higgledy-piggledy. It would never pass an OSHA inspection. The important thing about this picture is the sign in the middle, which says the Sperry and Treat Company. I love this picture because we found it near the end of the research when we'd already included Mr. Sperry and Mr. Treat in the book. So it's icing on the cake to have visual evidence of their firm at work. The first part of this talk is kind of bookish, but it leads to how the Builder Book came to be. This is a page from binders at the Preservation Trust office called the Historic Resources Inventory, or HRI. The HRI covers about 5,000 buildings in the city in great detail. The page on the screen is the HRI listing for the building we're in, the library. And there's the architect, Cass Gilbert, highlighted over there in yellow. Most HRI entries identify the architect along with the first owner. However, a few of the entries list the builder, not the architect. Here's the HRI page for 840 Howard Avenue, showing the builder was Lyman Treat. Who is Lyman Treat? Has anyone now living ever heard of him? What else did he build? I got even more curious when I realized that the next door house at 836 Howard was built by Lyman Treat's son, George Treat. Hmm, these builders had families. What do we know about them? Was it typical to bring the children into the business? Who knew? So these are photos of George Treat's house. You can see that he threw all his masonry skill at this house. Arches above the windows, stained glass windows, leafy terracotta tiles, lots of showy details. In 1886, when this was built, the house would have served as a marketing tool for the Treats masonry business. These two houses, 836 and 840, which is the next one to the west, north, uh, are owned by Yale New Haven Hospital, which to its credit has maintained them well and giving some uh, 19th century style to Upper Howard, Upper Howard Avenue. Here's another HRI entry. This is the page for 466 Orange Street, which we'll see in a minute, listing the builders as Nehemiah Sperry and Willis Smith. More builder names, now almost forgotten. Many of you know me. You know I've been a student of architecture in New Haven for a long time. But this was a hidden undercurrent, something I hadn't come across before. So out of curiosity, being me, I started making a collection of entries like this that featured the builder, not the architect. This is a photo of the Sperry House at 466 Orange, beautiful house. Um, it seems that Nehemiah Sperry's sister married Willis Smith, and the brothers-in-law went into business together. So now we know, not only did the builders have lives, their lives were intertwined. How many of these builders knew each other? Hmm. I began to have that eerie feeling you get when you start making connections. So one more bookish thing. This is a page from a book by Elizabeth Mills Brown called New Haven, A Guide to Architecture and Urban Design. You can see the title there. Um, prop. Here is my copy, which looks like the dog chewed it. <laughs> it comes up on eBay now and then. It's an important book about New Haven, and you can find it. Betty Brown, as we fondly call her, gives vivid and sometimes opinionated descriptions of many buildings in town residential, commercial, educational. Her note on Sperry and Smith says they were among New Haven's top builders after the Civil War. Right there, top builders after the Civil War. I'm not sure you can read that where you are, but it's in the book. 
Okay, if that's true, where's the evidence? Can I find it? A project started to take shape, compiling biographies of builders from the past. So, with the blessing of the Preservation Trust Board of Directors, I pitched a booklet, then it was going to be a 28-page booklet, about the lives of builders working from about 1810 to about 1930 to the State Historic Preservation Office. They thought it was a plausible idea and awarded a grant to the Preservation Trust. This is the map of the buildings and structures in the book. It's a mix of building types, architectural styles, and city locations. Isn't it a great map? Um, so, jumping to the bottom line, here's what I learned from this project. Things were fundamentally different then. The construction industry changed for all time in the 20th century. Along came power tools, electricity, steel framing, and so on. Today, a building is put together by contractors and subcontractors who may not have worked together before. They order parts from manufacturers in far-flung places, ship to the site on 18-wheelers. Their workers use forklifts and rivet guns. But think about it. For thousands of years, every building on Earth was put together by hand, using muscle power and hand tools. The era covered in the Builder Book was the last hurrah in that long, long period when handcrafted construction was the only option. And that seemed to me to be something worth writing about. So it's Jack's turn. He'll tell you what came next. So Susan reached out to me um, about doing this project uh, almost two years ago now. Um, and I felt so lucky as someone doing historical research in New Haven, um, because there are these fantastic collections of local history records that have been compiled at various institutions in the city over generations, um, run by librarians who know their collections really inside and out. Um, and so this includes the New Haven Free Public Library, where we are today, um, which has a really wonderful local history room. Um, it includes the Institute Library, library on Chapel Street, um, and this is a picture of me working at the New Haven Museum Library, um, where the librarian, Ed Serrato, was incredible in helping me navigate the card catalog, the archives, the collection generally. Um, and so the New Haven Museum Library was really where I did the bulk of my research. Um, we depended on a number of different categories of sources um, in performing the actual research of this book. Um, these are pictures of pages from Edward Atwater's History of the City of New Haven to the Present Time, which was published in 1887. Um, and it's one of the few biographical collections written in the late 1800s, which record the lives of literally thousands of New Haveners. Um, and amateur historians would compile these immense collections, record lives and achievements of their contemporaries, um, and some of the biographies were four to five pages um, with an attached portrait, like this one of James English. Um, and others were only kind of small paragraphs in sections that were generally compiled by professions. So a number of paragraphs on various carpenters or bricklayers in New Haven. The next kind of category of source, um, which is less formal than those big biographies, um, were scrapbooks like this one. Um, and this photo is of the Dana Collection at the New Haven Museum, which is an incredible collection of 150 or so volumes compiled by Arnold Dana, who was an amateur historian at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was kind of the perfect dream resource for this project, um, because the scrapbooks are organized by street, by house number, um, and they focus on the physical structures of the city. Um, and Dana included different forms of media, photographs, newspaper clippings, pages from books, all about New Haven structures, the people who built them, and the people who lived in them. Um, and so Dana really captured New Haven through this uniquely visual lens, which was incredibly creative in its process and diligent in its process as well. Um, now, not 
every builder was included in one of these biographies um, or in one of these big scrapbooks. Um, and that was especially the case for us because we aimed to select builders who worked in a variety of neighborhoods, came from diverse backgrounds. Um, so when they weren't included in these biographies or scrapbooks, the research became a little more painstaking. Um, and it involved gathering little bits of information from any source I could. Um, and this is a photo of some of the New Haven Museum's many city directories. Um, which are surprisingly helpful for giving that information on builders who might not have been as conventionally recognized by their contemporaries. Um, so in addition to addresses, directories also list occupations, death dates, um, often family members as well. So in looking up certain names, you can see how a builder's career evolved, where they lived over the course of their lives, and who they lived with. And then the last kind of category of source worth mentioning are newspapers like this one. Um, there are immense historical collections of newspapers that have been digitized and made searchable. Um, and again, as with the directories, we were looking for small bits of information in these newspapers, anecdotes, significant life events, um, and trying to pull these tidbits together to create a complete biography of someone who had not been written about in a complete way before. So, after doing 150 hours of research, Susan and I went back and forth writing the various biographies. Um, and this is the project laid out on Susan's living room floor um, when we were deciding you know, who would be in the book and who wouldn't, since we originally had 32 builders that, who we were hoping to feature um, and didn't necessarily get all the information we necessarily needed on all of those 32. Um, but we did eventually figure out who we could include, um, balancing kind of considerations of background and neighborhood. Um, and Susan can now tell you how we got from this point to a finished book. Okay, we can't go further without recognizing that the pictures are the book's pride and joy. All of them were taken by a longtime trust member, Jean Pogwiz. She's here tonight, but I doubt she will want to be recognized. There she is. Um, there are 55 sites in the book for which I estimate Jean took close to a thousand photographs. The weather, the direction of the sunlight, the amount of car traffic, and in some cases whether or not it was garbage day all came into play. <laughs> Jack and I wrote it, but Jean illustrated it, and we owe her a huge thank you. So here are five examples to give a sense of the variety in the book. This is the fence around the green. Nahum Hayward is one of the earliest builders in New Haven's written record. He was born in 1790 in Massachusetts. He and his wife had five children and lived on the east side of Church Street just south of Grove Street. So here's a peek into our research. We know this location because his house burned down and there was an article about it in the next day's newspaper. <laughs> Hayward was a member of the New Haven Common Council in the 1830s, appointed to a committee to carry out a detailed survey of the condition of the city's streets, including nuisances and obstructions. That was in his charge. He built some of the most recognizable houses of his era, including two on Hill House Avenue and the timeless house shown on the screen, <sighs> built in 1829. This is the Ingersoll House facing the green, as I said, built for the Honorable Ralph Ingersoll, who was a mayor and a congressman. In 1846, Hayward was hired to set the iron and stone fence around the New Haven green. This is the same fence. This was a lasting improvement over the older and much repaired wood fence. And the cost of $6,850 was funded by the city. At the time, the Connecticut State House was located on the green, so funding for the new fence was requested from the state, but was not approved. <laughs> the fence around the green is one of its most characteristic features, but few could name its builder. Yet Hayward was admired in his day. His tombstone in Grove Street Cemetery reads, erected by his Masonic brothers and fellow citizens in respect to the memory of an honest man. This is 
9 Worcester Place, um, built by James Edward English, perhaps the most famous of our builders. James E. English is usually described as a politician. He served as a senator and representative in both state and national legislatures, and as governor twice. But before his years in public service, English was trained as a carpenter, giving him a path to commercial and political success. He was born in 1812 in the family home on Chapel Street, and when he was 16, he was apprenticed to the carpenter Atwater Treat, also included in the Builder Book. Builders teaching the next generation of builders is one way the 19th century builders' lives were entwined. English had a flair for architectural design, although I have to confess that Mansard Roof was later. That was not in the early 1800s. Um, when his apprenticeship ended, he opened a business and built homes to his own designs. With his earnings as a carpenter, he bought a lumber yard, which became the source of his growing fortune over the next few decades. Although he commissioned many buildings in his lifetime, this may be the only one left from the three years he worked as a carpenter. English is a good example of one of the main themes of our book. Builders in this era were well known and active in civic life. A strong sense of public responsibility runs through almost every chapter. Many of these men served in local or state legislatures, ran for elective office, or were appointed to public boards and commissions. Others were directors of charitable organizations or church leaders. They earned public respect because of multiple skills acquired through their trade. They knew about management and about finances, as well as construction. So English had the energy and capacity to take on more than a dozen of these civic commitments. He and four others were named to the first New Haven Harbor Commission, established to improve the facilities of the port. With a fellow entrepreneur, he took over the failing New Haven Clock Company and built up one of the largest businesses of its kind in the country. When the New Haven Hospital outgrew its quarters, English and two others raised $40,000 in funds for a new building. And in 1884, English gave a large gift toward the construction of the newly created East Rock Park, and the park commissioners named the Easterly Approach English Drive in his honor. He was elected to the New Haven Common Council, Connecticut House of Representatives, State Senator, Governor, and U.S. Congress, all from his first three years as a carpenter. Um, so here's the punchline. English was a strong abolitionist. He said that his finest moment in Congress was voting in favor of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, bucking the opposition of most of his party. Reportedly, he said to his biographer, I suppose I am politically ruined, but that day was the happiest of my life. All right, this, uh, when we're on to a new builder, Stephen Perkins, over four decades in the 19th century, Stephen Perkins built or supervised the construction of dozens of buildings in this area. He was raised on his family's farm in Woodbridge, and for all but 13 years of his life, he lived on the farm where he was born. He was a leader in the early days of the Republican Party and served in the Connecticut legislature. Perkins' career took the typical path, learning the trade as an apprentice, working as a journeyman, and then going into business for himself. In 1852, he formed a firm of Perkins and Chatfield with one of his own former apprentices, Philo Chatfield. The firm contributed steadily to the growth of New Haven with construction commissions from mayors, businessmen, churches, the hospital, and Yale University. Perkins and Chatfield built from plans drawn by others, not from their own designs. They worked on about 50 downtown buildings, many of which remain, including City Hall, um, sidebar. If you go to City Hall, there's a plaque that lists the architect and then lists the builder, Perkins and Chatfield. Um, Trinity Church Chapel on George Street and the first of Yale University's fine arts buildings on Chapel Street, Street Hall. One of Perkins and Chatfield's buildings 
has a secret life hidden behind another building. This is kind of a complicated slide, so we'll take it in pieces. The photo on the upper right is the Union League Cafe. In 1802, oh, excuse me, 1902, that four-story brick facade was glommed on to the house shown in the middle, the Gaius Warner House. Warner was a leading industrialist who bought a large parcel on Chapel Street and commissioned Henry Austin to design his house. When Warner died, the house was purchased by Peter Carl, whose passion was building a 2,800-seat opera house in his backyard. Carl's Opera House opened to great fanfare, but due to big debts, Carl lost the property. The theater lived on. You may remember it as the Hyperion. Meanwhile, the house was purchased by a political society, society known as the Union League for use as their clubhouse. They needed more space, so they built the addition that we see today extending out to the sidewalk. A century later, the Warner House is still tucked inside the Union League building. How do we know that? Look at the photo on the left, which shows windows and sort of ghosts of windows on the east side of Union League Cafe. Now compare them to the windows on the Warner House on the photo in the middle. They match. There are public walkways on each side of um, the Union League building, so tomorrow you can go and check this out for yourself. The next slide is by the one woman featured in the book, Alice Washburn. Alice Washburn was a self-taught builder and designer who specialized in gracious custom-built homes. She was a school teacher, wife, and mother who did not begin her career in construction until she was 49. It's like, I did all these other things. Oh, I forgot, a career. <laughs> so she decided to enter the business world just as the suburbs of New Haven were experiencing a building boom in the 1920s. For a decade, Washburn's designs were in great demand for their appealing style and workmanship. She was known for her close supervision of every facet of construction, with a crew of carpenters and craftsmen who executed her designs as a team. Washburn insisted on a certain level of quality and built accordingly, even if the owner had not asked for a particular feature. When she added elements to suit her own standards, she would occasionally not charge the client for them. With her crew, Washburn built nearly 90 houses in New Haven, Hamden, Cheshire, and Woodbridge. Ten of these are in New Haven, built between 1924 and 1930. The house at Elmwood Road, shown on the screen, is a somewhat unusual example. The extra-large windows and corner pilasters are typical of Washburn designs, but the facade of 86 Elmwood, Elmwood is asymmetrical a more dynamic look compared to her other houses, which you can see in the book, with central entryways and symmetrical windows to each side. Unfortunately, Washburn's refusal to compromise on building details, along with her lack of business experience, were factors in her inability to withstand the Depression. And her business closed in 1931. She died in 1958, unremarked, except by family members and members of her long-standing crew. Admiration for her talent has uh, steadily grown. Another prop. There is a dandy monograph about her available online. Um, this does not come up very often for sale, um, but we have scanned it if any of you are interested. So, the last of our examples is Long Wharf Pier, built by William Lanson. William Lanson has become widely recognized in our era, but his achievement at Long Wharf Pier is not easy to understand. A free black man, Lanson and his family moved to New Haven in 1803. Within seven years, he had become the city's principal wharf builder, 
say that fast, wharf builder, hired by developer James Hillhouse to extend Long Wharf Pier out to the shipping channel in the harbor. Long Wharf Pier dates back to the late 1600s, but for about 140 years, the dock did not reach the shipping channel. Hmm. Lanson convinced Hillhouse that he could extend the wharf and give a boost to the export trade. He realized that wooden piers did not give enough support in the deep mud flats of New Haven Harbor. He designed a way to bring large stones downstream on barges that could each hold 25 tons using stone as the structure of the wharf. This new technique enabled him to extend Long Wharf by 1,325 feet, at the time the longest wharf in the country. That much is fact, but try to visualize it. 1,325 feet is about a quarter mile, about the distance from this room to the front door of the Omni Hotel. You and I would not want to lay even one row of stones that distance. So, Hillhouse stakes Lanson to some big barges, which were then called scows, and Lanson finds a hillside, legend has it in East Haven, where he can excavate boulders. Here's where I start to wonder, how did he get so many stones out of the ground, down the hill, and onto his barges? Remember, no power tools. Perhaps he had carts and teams of oxen. None of the biographers say much about the labor involved, but when you give it some thought, it's hard to imagine. Not to mention that the first 20 or 30 barge loads of stones would have sunk into the mud without a trace. So it's no wonder that his relentless drive to complete the project was widely admired. When he was done, the largest ships could be tied to the wharf at all stages of the tide, avoiding the need to anchor offshore and unload onto lighter vessels to bring the cargo into port. So here you see Lanson stones, still functional, 210 years later, under the capstones added during the construction of I-95. To wrap up, we're going to talk about we're going to each talk about our two favorite builders. These examples may not be the most important, but they're the ones that came to life for us. So back to Jack. So the builders who were most memorable for me were those who represented both the joys and challenges of this research project um, and of the task that Susan and I pursued for almost a year and a half, which was building complete portraits of historical characters to be paired against structures in New Haven that are still standing today. Um, Atwater Treat um, was one of the easiest builders to research. Um, he was featured in the compiled biographies. He was in the Dana scrapbook. He was beautifully commemorated with some obituaries on his death. Um, and like many of our builders, he received vocational education, um, learning carpentry as an apprentice beginning at the age of 17. Um, and he contributed to both residential and commercial buildings, big and small projects, um, including the Exchange Building, um, which most of you have probably been inside. Um, but what interests me most about him um, really kind of has nothing to do with his building experience. Um, I think most of these stories, it would be a mistake to kind of interpret them as um, builders pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. You know, these were builders who operated in a network, um, a, a heavily networked community. Um, and Atwater Street really embodied the kind of civic engagement um, which runs throughout the book. Um, and, you know, he was originally just a carpenter, but later in his life he became a religious leader. He founded libraries. Um, he helped to save the New Haven Hospital from bankruptcy. He advocated for abolition and supported black education and suffrage. And so his biography really demonstrates the extent to which these carpenters and masons were also community builders. Um, and Atwater's obituary talks about his buildings as, quote, bearing witness by their own symmetry and solidity to the beauty and strength of character of him who built them. 
And I think this quote really beautifully, beautifully summarizes the artistry of the trades in New Haven at the time, but it also remarks on his life as demonstrative of the intention that builders brought to both their vocations and their lives in public service. And the other builder who I've chosen to feature was named Ettore Frattari, and he was an Italian immigrant who came to New Haven sometime in the early 20th century. Um, and the research process in terms of Frattari was almost the polar opposite of it, as it was for Atwater Treat, um, in that he was not mentioned in Dana, and he was not featured in those, contemporary, in those biographies compiled by his contemporaries. Um, he was a recent immigrant, at uh, the time, part of a new wave of Italian migration to the United States. Um, and he wasn't recognized by his contemporaries, despite possessing, obviously, immense skill as a carpenter, um, as kind of this house on Elm Street can show. And so because information on Frattari was so sparse, um, I really leaned heavily on sources like the city directories um, and census documents like the one displayed here. Um, and those in the back might not be able to see, but Frattari's name is listed along with his wife, Josephine, their ages, country of origin, right in the top right corner. Um, and Frattari's case demonstrated the importance of recording history as we live it um, and ensuring that the lens with which we determine what to record aims to take in as wide a view as possible. Frattari, a recent immigrant, was much like, less likely to be featured in those biographies and was also less likely to have the business opportunities that builders like Atwater Treat were offered. Um, and the fact that his story wasn't recorded, wasn't necessarily seen as significant at the time, makes it harder but so much more necessary to paint a reliable portrait of his life almost a century later. And now, back to Susan for yours. This is the Ezekiel Trowbridge House, built by, uh, designed and built by Sidney Mason Stone. Stone represents a major professional shift going on at this time. He was born in 1803 and studied engineering at the newly opened New York University. Then he came back to New Haven and advertised himself as a master builder. Over time, he moved away from hands-on building and adopted the role of an architect. He often competed for jobs with a more famous local architect, Henry Austin. Stone designed over 100 churches, including a remodel of the interior of United Church on the Green. Sidney Stone was not alone in moving back and forth between the builder's role and the architect's role. Through the century, this excuse me, distinction between builders and architects remained fluid. Read more about this in Christopher Wiegren's superb introduction to the Builder book. Stone never wanted to be pinned down to one particular style, but all of his buildings are graceful and well detailed. This building, built in 1852, is now the Center Church Parish House, just one building up the street from us. Stone used the fashionable Italianate style in the early 1850s and embellished the four-square house with an intricately carved porch unlike any other in New Haven. My other favorite builder is Willis Minor Smith. Smith was born in Woodbridge in 1819. His family is one of the oldest in town, going back to Reverend Woodbridge himself. Like many of our other builders, he came to New Haven in his early 20s, hired on as an apprentice, and then worked as a journeyman mason. He married Mary Sperry, the daughter of another old Woodridge family and sister of Nehemiah Sperry, as I described earlier. The construction partnership that the brothers formed lasted under several names for almost 100 years. Willis Smith's greatest achievement was superintending the construction of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument at the top of East Rock Park. The monument is dedicated to men who served in four wars, an expression of 19th century idealism on a large scale. All you need to know is that the bronze statues at the four corners are called prosperity, victory, history, and patriotism. 
Smith devised a derrick that could be raised and lowered to lay the stones for the shaft of the monument. He perfected a method for laying stone in below freezing temperatures, and he invented a complicated hoist to close the opening at the top of the shaft. The monument was dedicated in June 1887. If you'll permit me, I want to read a few sentences from the book. The dedication of the Soldiers and Sailors Monument was the largest celebration in New Haven's history. The bells of Trinity Church rang out at sunrise, answered by gun salutes from a warship in the harbor. Every horse owned by the Fairhaven to Westville Street Railroad was called on to drive carriages to the top of East Rock Park. Along streets lined with flags, the parade had seven divisions of military and honorary members. Two Civil War generals participated. It was reported, not verified, reported that 175,000 people attended the parade and the ceremony. Almost half of Willis Smith's 700-word obituary in the New Haven Morning Journal and Courier was devoted to this accomplishment. The Soldiers and Sailors Monument is his legacy to the city, visible for miles around. So, as we wrap up, let's touch on what Jack and I would like you to take away from this talk. We hope it awakens your curiosity. As you walk or bike around town, you might say, that's an unusual building. I wonder who built it and how it's lasted this long. This slide shows examples in different neighborhoods that you might come across and take a closer look at. We hope this helps you to be observant of the historic architecture of this city and learn to value it as much as we do. This project made me so much more aware of how history deepens our understandings of the present. Um, and I became more conscious of how New Haven is both a physical city and a community of people. And I'm now thinking constantly about the work people have done to build this community over generations. Um, and being involved with these people and in this research felt deeply personal to me. Um, you know, over the course of the research, you see how so many of them lost children and spouses and siblings, how their careers experienced these ups and downs. So I really hope that this project and this book um, itself feels personal to the people who read it um, and gives a sense that experiencing history is kind of to experience a life. As you might guess, this was not a two-person effort. We have many people to thank. Thanks to the library staff, especially to Allison Botello, who could not be here this evening, and to Tom, Christopher Wiegren, Jean Pogwiz, Karen Crockmall, Mark Zarolo, Ed Serrato, Rona Johnston, the Trust's own Molly Durand, and other faithful research helpers readers, and commenters. Above all, I need to thank Jack for his perseverance and his talent for picking the right details out of stilted Victorian text. <laughs> it has been a joy to work with him, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Susan and Jack, what was the biggest surprise that you found when you were reading, when you were looking is there anything that stuck out that surprised you most of all? Um, well, I, I have to say for me, the surprise was how um, elevated the community viewed these trades. They were not uh, invisible people in their time. They were well-known, widely respected, and as you can tell from the talk, held positions of importance. And uh, there's no way you would have known that before researching the book. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. And going off that as well, um, you know, you, you expect, and I expected in the research to see builders working together kind of in their trades. Um, 
but there was an immense degree of collaboration in those kind of civic positions and in those leadership positions in the city um, between builders who might not have worked together actually vocationally, but did work together in these um, careers of public service that ran parallel to their vocational careers. Um, what add-ons did Washburn find most necessary? And what was her reasoning <laughs> behind her well, I'm not a Washburn excerpt, expert, but I can give you one example. In that 86 Elmwood house, there's a detached garage, which is around the corner, not attached to the house. It has the same detailing, round columns, corner pilasters, all of the same um, woodwork styling as the main house, which you know is an example of the kind of um, Consistency she, she wanted to see throughout her whole projects. Yes. Um, in walking around New Haven, often I do see, as, as you mentioned, oh gee, that's a pretty unique design. I wonder more about it. Does the New Haven Museum have the records of almost all the old buildings in New Haven where someone can research the history? Of? I, I would direct you to the 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 bookish things we had at the beginning, the Historic Resources Inventory, which is a paper resource at the trust office at 922 State Street, open to the public. Um, all of those 5,000 uh, buildings are described in terms of, um, I would say, historical and architectural uh, background. And if you noted an address in your travels, and stopped in or called Molly at the office and said, I'd like to come look up XYZ, 38 Grand Street, Grand Avenue. Um, you're welcome to do that. Yes. I was wondering, I've noticed in New Haven on some of the broad streets like Whitney Avenue, it seems that some of the nicest pieces of property are on corners. Is that because of any zoning at the time? There was no zoning until about 1926. Um, even more surprising to me, and maybe this was an answer to Bruce's question, um, the city didn't care much about domestic architecture. Building permits weren't required until, well, it's arguable what date, but until approximately 1890. <coughs> building permits weren't required. Um, and I think it was sort of left to the market. I don't, I mean, I don't know whether a corner property would be viewed as more valuable or not, but um, it wasn't regulated by the city. Yeah. Did you find any other hidden places like the Warner House? <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the main, that was the yeah. main. And, and we took a little while deciding whether or not to include that in the book because the aim was to kind of include buildings that were still standing and still visible. Um. Um, I can't think of any right now, but, but as you drive around or walk around, you'll see many examples. Uh, the restaurant Tres Galini, for instance, where someone has put a storefront on a former large residence. Um, and the interesting thing about the Tres Galini, which is at the corner of um, Worcester and Franklin, I think, um, it still has its monitor on the top. It's, I used to call them cupolas until I was corrected, but it's a monitor. Um, all the elements of the house are still there, but the storefront is what is most visible. And there's plenty of those. Yes. Well, first of all, great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, a couple questions. You could decide what you want to answer. You, you went from 32 builders down to 23. Do you know the names of the nine that you took out? That's <laughs> one. <laughs> Two, um, another natural time to stop instead of the Depression would have been World War II, when building completely stopped for many years. Um, and then three, uh, was there any factories that impre were, had impressive buildings. I, I'm too young to remember the Wil Winchester beating arms factories and things like that, but New Haven was full of factories. Was there any great builders of, of factories? 
So let me go back to the first question. Yes, I can't tell you the names of the nine tonight, but I have, uh, I don't know quite what to do with it because I understand you're supposed to keep this stuff. I have a stack of paper like this, um, which literally has yes and no on a number of pages. Um, the, the only reason for leaving out the nine, there's nothing significant about, uh, insignificant about them. We just couldn't find enough material about them. These, what recorded history, I mean, as Jack mentioned earlier, what is recorded in history is um, accidental. And you, you can't always find, didn't somebody write a song, you can't always get what you want? <laughs> um, your second question? World War II as a stop. Oh, um, it, it could have been, but we were more interested in the um, era when it was still done with horses and wood. And by 1930, 35, uh, there was plenty of electricity around, and uh, there were trucks and steam engines, and it was different. And the third question. Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I admit I don't know the answer. Who <laughs> built the clock factory? Who built Winchester? Didn't come up. There are people in the room who could answer that. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Do you have a sense of what proportion of the legacy of all these builders is still standing and active in New Haven? Proportion. Fifty percent, ten percent. Kind of depends where you are. Downtown and around the university campus, I would say it's ten percent. Um, Fairhaven and some of the neighborhoods that. Um, perhaps weren't as economically successful, the housing stock and even the commercial buildings from the 19th century are still standing side by side and side and filling streetscapes. So it varies is the answer. I couldn't give you an overall. No, but a w wonderful way to kind of explore like that passage through time is to go to the New Haven Museum and look at the Dana scrapbook. Um, because you can see, especially I'm thinking of the streets around the university, um, you can see quite a few buildings that, you know, the university tore down, you know, whether their owns or their own or residential um, buildings. And, you know, that history and scrapbook was basically made in the 1920s. Um, so it's a really interesting way to see how kind of the streets have evolved since then and includes a lot of photographs, which I enjoyed personally. <laughs> and remember the Another surprising thing, good question, Bruce, I keep coming back to it. Another surprising thing is that Westville was a suburb. In this era, Westville was the country, and no one knows that better than Barbara Lamb. So what remains there now um, has more to do with, I guess, when it was built and what it was in competition with. So there's more original texture there because uh, it was built later and built to satisfy perhaps a different taste. Yes. Um, did you also, by chance, look at any of the interiors of some of the houses that you, because New Haven has some incredible uh, detail work in many of the houses that are in the city, and I just wondered if you happened to look at the interiors of any. I love doing that. But what we were hoping to do was produce um, a compilation of biographies where you could, the public, you, could actually go and see the building that the builder built. And most of these interiors would be not accessible to the public. So, do you remember any particular interiors? Well, the, uh, mm -hmm. the city hall, for instance, is one that uh, that's true. open to the public. And right. And in fact, the building we're in, um, there's, I didn't have room or time to put it in the presentation, but in the Yale um, Manuscripts and Archives collection, there's a fabulous photo of the construction of this building. Um, you know, <laughs> well, digging. They, they, they um, were using hand tools and horses. Anyone else? 
Thank you very much. Okay. Huh. <laughs>